the screen bigger. Can you hear me still? Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Um, I have a brief presentation planned that uh, I, I can show you guys a little bit about some of the recent things that have been happening in search, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Um, I can go through it a little bit faster. Um, feel free to raise your hand or slow me down if uh, there's anything you'd like to look at in more detail. So let me just see if I can pull that up. Uh, can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. All right. So in general, I just wanted to touch on four main topics that are where I think some things are happening at the moment where it's probably useful to have a little bit of an advanced, I guess, heads up so that you can get prepared when clients come to you or if you're working with websites directly. Um, mobile, obviously a big topic uh, for crawling and indexing. We have uh, some things in security and search console. And then, like I said, some time for questions and answers. Uh, for mobile, I'll just jump over these numbers, but uh, essentially mobile is important nowadays. So you've probably seen that with uh, the mobile friendly update that we did earlier this year. And I suspect it'll just get, go more and more in that direction, that more and more people will want to have a mobile friendly site. More and more people will use the internet primarily on a mobile device. So that's kind of in which direction we're heading. Um, the Googlebot that we use uses an iPhone user agent. Uh, we'll probably update that at some point to a newer iPhone, I guess at some soon time. Um, we usually crawl from the US. I suspect that's less of an issue for you, since you're probably targeting users in the US anyway. And the rest should be pretty clear here. One thing that's really kind of upcoming or coming up more and more is also in integrating apps in search. So um, we see lots of people who create great apps, and they also have a great website. And we think that sometimes it makes sense to show an app directly in the search results on a smartphone so that users can go directly to an app and get the content there instead of going to a web page. There's some technical things that need to be done to make that work. but. Uh, if you have an app for a website or have a client that ha also has an app, then I'd definitely look into the app indexing setup. Um, mobile friendly, I suspect you've all seen something like this. So essentially, we're looking at pages where you can scroll up and down, and left and right, and zooming in and out is something that's kind of hard for users to do. Uh, some of the things we've seen as being problematic with mobile friendly is when embedded content is blocked, so we can't tell that it's mobile friendly. I'll go into that a little bit uh, later as well. Flash, obviously, most mobile phones don't show Flash content. And then there are some technical issues where if you use your phone to access a website, you see them right away. So you click on a link and search, it takes you the, to the mobile home page instead of the page that you actually wanted to find from the search results, for example. Or you click on a link and search, and it takes you to an error page that says, hey, this page doesn't exist on mobile. And it's, instead of showing you the desktop content, it uh, just shows you an error. Um, let me just see here. Some of the things that uh, kind of recently We've also been seeing people have problems with our interstitials, so especially app inter install interstitials. So you go to the mobile page, but instead of seeing the content, you see a big interstitial that says, hey, you should download our app. And that's annoying for users, but it's also a problem for us, because then we'll crawl and index this interstitial instead of finding the content. Uh, the mobile-friendly test. You've probably all seen that, uh, the usability reports in Webmaster Tools or Search Console now uh, also give you some aggregated input on how your site is doing with regards to mobile friendly. So I definitely check that out. Um, testing in Chrome is really easy as well. I use this all the time, almost 
I don't know, daily. Uh, when I run across a website, and I'm not sure how it actually works on mobile, there's a really easy way to, you can flip uh, Chrome to actually show you uh, what it would look like on mobile so that you can try it out on your desktop without having to like retype the URL or send yourself the URL by email, all of those crazy things. OK. So now we're at crawling indexing surveying. There are two main things that I think will be uh, affecting SEOs and webmasters uh, quite a bit going forward. And these aren't necessarily new, but uh, they're they kind of bring a different kind of thinking into the, the whole process. On the one hand, there is rendering in JavaScript. So Googlebot can render pages like a browser can do that. Uh, so it can view JavaScript-based content. So if you have a JavaScript framework, like, I don't know, one of these, and your content is all served with Ajax calls, uh, those kind of things, then that's something that traditionally, when an SEO would look at that, would say, oh my god, nobody can index this. You need to fix this right away. And nowadays, Googlebot is pretty smart, actually, at being able to render those pages and being able to pull out all of the content uh, that, that comes from there. So in, when you run across a site that has a JavaScript-based menu or that has, pulls in content with JavaScript, that's not necessarily a sign that they're doing something completely wrong. Um, that can work in search just as well. So that's something that I think will kind of bring a little bit of a, a, a change of philosophy, I guess, in, into the SEO side of things where JavaScript-based sites can be perfectly fine, and you can do some really fancy things with them. Uh, you can iterate very quickly if you have a JavaScript framework and really create some uh, fantastic websites that way. Obviously, it's still, I guess, early days when it comes to JavaScript in the sense that not all other search engines are able to do that this well. So at the moment, you might need to almost do both variations or find a middle ground or think about which search engines you want to target and make sure that your content works there. But at least from our point of view, JavaScript-based sites work really well. But uh, with the kind of the being able to render pages, one thing we've noticed is that uh, kind of needs to be rethought on the SEO side as well is that uh, traditionally, if you go back maybe 10 years, uh, a lot of sites would robot out embedded source resources like CSS files, JavaScript, uh, those kind of things, because way back then, search engines were kind of not so smart, and they might uh, have indexed some of these JavaScript files or CSS files, or you'll search for, I don't know, a brand name, and you'll find their robots text in the search results instead of their home page, those kind of things. So that's something that way in the past it used to make sense to kind of block those files, but now that we try to render these pages, uh, we need to be able to actually crawl the CSS files, the JavaScript files, the responses from the server, all of those things. So that's something where, um, depending on how you've been setting up websites, you might want to reconsider how you create the robots text file for that so that the pages and all of their embedded content can be crawled normally so that Googlebot can see what's found on those pages and render those pages appropriately. Um, we use the embedded content for rendering. So it's something that we use for kind of understanding how the page looks, but we don't use the embedded content files for indexing. So it's not the case that we would index a CSS file and show that in search, but rather we just use it to kind of render this page, understand what's visible, and make that available appropriately in search. Um, for that, if you have more complicated robots text files, I'd recommend reviewing uh, the order of precedence documentation that we have for robots text. Uh, because that gives you a little bit of insight on what you can tweak in the robots text file to allow crawling of these files without opening things up elsewhere that you might want to keep locked down. All right. Um, next big topic that uh, comes up 
I guess again and again as well from our side, uh, security is something that I don't think is going to go away, especially HTTPS. Uh, we're actively moving all of Google's content to be secured by HTTPS. And uh, we assume that most of the web will be moving in that direction too. So HTTPS isn't something that just protects a user from like someone eavesdropping their connection, but it also protects the content that's being transmitted there. So uh, for instance, what we've seen is sometimes ISPs will inject ads in pages, or sometimes some ads on the page themselves will get changed. So we've seen things like AdSense code being changed with another ID, and the user doesn't know about that. And uh, the user assumes that everything that they receive from the ISP is actually from the server directly, but uh, things might be modified along the way. So this is something where uh, we really think it makes sense to move the whole way up to HTTPS. And there are lots of, lots of different groups that are moving in that direction as well. So this whole process is getting easier and easier. So it's not quite as complicated as before. But I think uh, it's important that you kind of get started at some point and start practicing maybe with your own site or a blog or something like that so that you understand how this process works with regards to uh, mixed content warnings, those kind of issues, and really so that all of the new sites that you set up work with HTTPS by default from the start. Uh, another really important topic around security is getting hacked, or not getting hacked, rather. Um, this is something where we've seen a lot of sites actually run into problems in that they'll have a great website, it'll be up and running, and then someone hacks it and hides something on the website. And the webmaster doesn't really know where it is, can't find it, has trouble cleaning that up, doesn't even know what the consequences are. And uh, that's a really big problem for us, because on the one hand, we trust this website. We think it's a great website. On the other hand, suddenly it changes that it has a bunch of pharmaceutical content on it. So that's. On our side as well, kind of a problem, how do we treat this website in search? Do we trust it in the future, or is this something that's going to flip back and forth randomly? Um, a few things help to really prevent that in, in the sense that, uh, obviously, you need secure software to make sure that uh, things are working well. But having your account locked down is something that's really, really important as well. We see lots of phishing attacks where people will try to uh, siphon off email addresses and passwords. And uh, if they can get into your account with just the email address and the password, then chances are they can get into your website. They can do password resets. They can get into your ad system, whatever you have there. So that's something where I strongly recommend that you set up two-factor authentication for everything, including for your clients, if that's possible. Um, obviously, keep everything current, any software that you install. Remove anything unnecessary. So if you've set up an image gallery on your website and you decided you don't actually use that anymore, I'd remove that completely. Because any software that you have on your server uh, that you forget about updating could potentially be uh, manipulated and kind of hacked into. And uh, finally, if you do find that someone hacks your website, don't just remove the hacked content, but rather figure out how they got in there in the first place. Uh, one thing I've seen with one of my older websites is uh, back in the day, it, it got hacked. I fixed the hack. I removed all of the, the crazy stuff they put on there. Um, I couldn't figure out how they actually got in. So the next day, they came back and put it all back. And this went back and forth for, I don't know, maybe one and a half, two weeks, um, where basically they were just hacking it through the same way again, over and over again, until I figured out what I needed to change there. Nowadays, fixing vulnerabilities is a lot easier, because you can just do an update of your software, and usually that'll fix it. All right, uh, Search Console, or Webmaster Tools, as it used to be called. Uh, one neat thing that came out very recently is the API for Search Analytics. Um, I think this is really neat, especially if you have uh, a larger set of sites, for example, where you want to combine the queries that you receive. So if you have different top-level domains, if you have different brands, for example, or if you have a marketing site, and, uh, 
like your main website and you want to combine all of the search information that you have there, this is something that's really easily done uh, with, with a small script using the search analytics tool. Uh, you can also pull out information like uh, which keywords led to which URL on your website so that you can kind of rebuild the uh, not provided information that's no longer shown in analytics. A um, bunch of other features that are added recently to Search Console. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of these. But I guess, in general, uh, I'd really recommend making sure that you do set up Search Console for your websites, because that's how we tend to give the most information to webmasters. If anything is broken, if something is not working as it should be, if there's something on our site that's changing that's affecting your website, we try to inform you uh, through Search Console, through an email alert or the message in Search Console directly. Uh, I'd recommend verifying all site variants that you have, so HTTP, HTTPS, non www. Uh, and in the MDOT sites, if you have that as well, just to make sure that you get all of the information that's available for your websites. Uh, one thing that's commonly confused, for example, is if you move from HTTP to HTTPS and you look at your data in Search Console and you see, oh my god, all the clicks went down, uh, index pages went down, and you don't realize that you're looking at the HTTP version, not the HTTPS version. So by having those different variants verified, it's a lot easier to get the full picture of how your site is doing. Um, with regards to verification in Search Console, I recommend using delegation. So you can verify it once as kind of like the main owner, and you can add multiple people to that account as well. If you want with uh, read-only access, for example, if uh, it's an SEO that just wants to look at your metrics, look at how things are going, then maybe read-only access is the right setup for that. But that's something that you can define. And you can also revoke these uh, verifications at any time so that you can kind of maintain that however you need it without manually having to change anything on the website. Whew. OK. Um, with that, I'm kind of finished through my slides here. Um, I hope you all took notes. There'll be a test, I guess. Ooh, I can't hear you anymore. <laughs> Testing. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Uh, yeah, a lot of people are taking notes. <clears throat> Thank you for that presentation. Um, Any has got questions? I think I'm going to start with one question. But uh, I've noticed local on, like, with this Panda and Penguin handle local algorithms, I mean, di different than they do, you know, like an international site? Not really. So we, we kind of treat those the same. We treat those as search quality web spam algorithms in general. But it's not the case that these sites are demoted by a fixed number of positions, for example but rather that we try to kind of apply that to the relevance that we receive. So if something is really, really relevant for a specific query or a location, then even if it's generally demoted a little bit for lower quality content, then we might still show that fairly high in search. OK, yeah, because like, I've run into some sites here that uh, locally that you know just total spam and terrible, but they're ranking number one. You know. Yeah, I, I think that's something you probably want to just submit with a spam report so that uh, the web spam team can take a look at that and see what's going on there. All right. Uh, questions? Matt? Can you walk us through what factors of on-page user activity play into the algorithm? Um, we tend not to use much of that for, for search at all. So um, it's something where you tend to see a lot of indirect um, effects. So if people like your website, then they'll recommend it more. But we don't really see what they actually do on your website. So that's something where we wouldn't say we'll use Google Analytics. We, we don't use that at all for search, uh, crawling, indexing, ranking. So. One aspect that uh, we do kind of do there is with regards to 
um, fine tuning our algorithms or testing our algorithms in general in that we'll say, well, we've made this specific change in our algorithms for ranking, for example, and we'd like to see aggregated across all of the billions of search results that we get, how does it affect what users do? Like, do they click on the first result or does it happen that they click on the second result more now with this change, which might be a sign that we're getting something wrong? So on an aggregate scale, it really helps us to understand how our algorithms are doing and if specific changes are better or worse. But on like a per page basis, that's something that I don't think we, we can really take into account. OK. Anyone else? Some more questions? OK. Um, on the en encryption side, when you were talking about putting the SSL on your website, is there a certain level of encryption you need to use? No. No, it's just whatever browsers currently accept. If you have a modern certificate, that, that works perfectly well. I think there's some types of certificates that you can't buy nowadays anymore that the browser will show like a, with a grayed out uh, uh, lock symbol to kind of say, well, this uh, encryption isn't really uh, modern anymore in the sense that it's not secure. Gotcha. Uh, do you have a question? Anybody? Matt? Are there any industry-specific variables that go into the algorithm? Into the algorithm, most, I, I can't think of anything. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, but I mean, that what we do is we, we do take a lot of factors into the algorithm in the sense that sometimes uh, different industries might get looked at differently because just because those industries are a little bit different in the sense that uh, if you have a local flower shop, for example, and you compare it to a big online e-commerce site, then obviously they're going to be ranking for different kinds of queries and it's almost like they, they have like a different set of competition that they're working on. So it's not that the algorithm is treating those sites specifically differently, but they're kind of active in their own niche. And within that niche, the requirements are a little bit different. Uh, what we do sometimes do, though, is from a web spam point of view that uh, the web spam team will go off and say, oh, we've noticed this type of industry or this type of website or this specific tactic is really popular among spammers. And we're going to do kind of a roundup about that and say, OK, it's time to take a look at these specific types of sites. They're generally very spammy. So the web spam team will go off and do kind of a manual roundup of those kind of sites that um, might be problematic, might be doing something problematic. And that's something that wouldn't go into the algorithm, but would instead be visible as a manual action in Search Console, for example. OK. Any more questions? Anyone? Here we go. Um, what are the biggest factors um, for the algorithm um, that, that Google takes in place for search results? The biggest factors, that's really kind of tricky because we, we do take into account, I think, over 200 factors. And like I mentioned before, it's not that we have kind of like the same weighting for every website in the sense that if you're competing with uh, some really large online e-commerce sites, then obviously we're going to be a lot stricter with regards to what we look at on a page, uh, with regards to the signals that we get from outside of the page compared to maybe a smaller local shop. So it's not the case that I'd say individual factors are stronger or less strong, but it kind of depends on, on the niche that you're active in. Um, some of the things, I guess, that uh, I look at more with regards to like a general website is, on the one hand, the, the whole technical basis, the whole technical foundation is something that's really important for us. And that's not something where I'd say from a quality point of view or a ranking point of view, we need to kind of see that it's a well-made site, but rather we won't be able to crawl it or index it properly if it's not really made in a way that, that works well with search. We're getting better and better at kind of being able to understand sites that 
that don't have like static HTML on them directly, but uh, there are things like if you have no index on your home page, if you have the rel canonical set up incorrectly, if the links within the site don't really work that well, then all of these things kind of add up, and then we can't, from a technical point of view, we can't actually get to that content. So that's something where I see a lot of problems from time to time, uh, even with big websites. Uh, the other thing that I focus on more instead of individual ranking factors is kind of the overall quality that you're providing on your website. The, the general, I don't know how, how you would call it, like uh, what you do with your users, why would they come back, what are you providing that really encourages them to kind of regularly come back to your website, to recommend your website to other people. And these are things that they don't depend on like any lines of HTML or meta tags or any kind of tricks, but rather it's something that you'd almost want to do from a marketing point of view anyway. And those are the kind of tactics that work really well in the long run. So if you have a website where people find the information that they want and they keep coming back, they keep recommending it to other people, then that's something that will work in the long run. It's not uh, anything that'll kind of be like a fad and any kind of a special ranking factor that comes and goes. Is there, any, is there any software that you would recommend for analyzing the site's optimization? Other, for like WordPress, I use Yoast and things like that, but for other avenues? For analyzing the site, um, it's hard to say. I guess Search Console comes to mind, but you're probably asking something uh, more specific. Um, what, it's, it's hard to say like, uh, with regards to the site's performance, because that's something you probably see in analytics as well, how users are acting on your site. Uh, one thing I, I've traditionally liked to do is just crawl the website. So using any kind of a crawler to kind of crawl the website to make sure that uh, I can get to all of the content that's important to me by following the links, uh, that uh, I'm not running into infinite spaces. So we call them infinite spaces when you run into a part of a website that could essentially go on infinitely, where maybe it's a calendar where you can always click on next and you end up in the year 9 million. Uh, that's something that for search engines, they don't really realize that they're running into this kind of infinite area, and they might get stuck and might forget about crawling the rest of your site. So doing a crawler across a website, I think, gives you, at least in the beginning, a sense for how is this website structured? Is all of the content being found? Is there something that's maybe missing? Is it running into areas where it's getting stuck? Those kind of things. And there are different kinds of crawlers out there. There's some free crawlers out there. I've seen lots of people use Screaming Frog, which sounds like a good tool, has a funny name at least. Um, some of these crawlers are a little bit more advanced in that you can extract that information and see what are the page titles that are here. Do I have any issues with like duplicate page titles that I could be cleaning up? Or maybe meta tags, those kind of things. So, Kind of depends on how far you want to go, but I think a crawler is always a, a good step. Also at kind of emulating how search engines would look at a website, because in, in the past, I found a lot of people put their website online, and they wait a couple of months, and they see it showing up in search, but they don't really realize what happens behind the scenes, what, what technical steps might be happening that they might be impacting as well. Great question. Uh on robots text file, is is there a problem with blocking like the WP or the the plugins and admin pages? Um, so I I saw a recent post by by Yoast or recent I think from earlier this year at least uh, where he's advocating not blocking anything on on WordPress in general. So 
the, the problem, I guess, with locking the admin section is that uh, people who want to hack, hack into your website, they already know that the admin section is there. And if you block it in the robots text, that's not going to change anything. So instead of blocking it, just serving it with a no index probably makes more sense. Uh, with regards to plugins, I can see that it sometimes makes sense to block those. But especially if those plugins are serving CSS or JavaScript files that are visible or used within the pages, then that'll be blocked there as well if you block those plugins in general. So that's something where I'd be kind of cautious with regards to what you're actually blocking there. And uh, I guess the thing to keep in mind is that with the robots text block, you're not preventing it from being indexed. If someone links to those specific pages or that part of your website, it can still get indexed even if we haven't looked at the content. So we'll try to take like the, the anchor text of the link leading there, use that as a title and have like the, the description. We, we don't know what this page is about. It's blocked by robots text. But just because it's blocked doesn't mean that it can't get indexed. OK. And I, I want to kind of ask you straightforward, because you, know, you hear all kinds of things. And this is more for the listeners but, and the viewers. But on duplicate content, is on-page duplicate content, so if you have two different pages with the same content on it, is that something that could po possibly get you penalized, or is that more for duplicate content taken from another site? Good question. So this comes up all the time. I, I, good, good point in raising that. So from, from a web spam point of view, it's really only a problem for us if the content is scraped from multiple sources from other sites. So if you have a site that aggregates content from a bunch of different sources, and you don't provide any value of your own, then that's, oops, uh, music time. Um, let me just mute my mic for a second. Thought I was the problem person. <laughs> You shouldn't be doing this from an elevator. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> or a bell tower. <laughs> I did not. Surprise. <laughs> okay. okay. I didn't realize they played it here in this meeting room as well. So <laughs> this is something they, they play on Friday at 5 p.m. to make everyone come down for TGIF. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Surprise. Um, so with regards to duplicate content, uh, from a manual actions point of view, so from the web spam team, they really only care about content that's scraped from multiple sources. So if your site doesn't provide any additional value, then that's something where the web spam team might take action on that and demote it or remove it from search completely. Uh, with regards to like on-site duplicate content, if you have things like an extreme case, just dub, 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 nom, dub, 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 then that's something that, from our point of view, is more of a technical issue in the sense that we need to crawl both of these versions. We recognize they're the same, so we'll fold them together for the index and just focus on one version. Uh, that, I think, from that point of view, it's not something that would negatively affect your website, other than that we would have to crawl more pages in order to see what's actually shown. Right, so that's especially in like in a blog. So it's probably if there's a reason you have two different versions, it's probably best to use the canonical, right? Yeah, the canonical helps. Uh, a redirect helps to kind of clean that up. All of those things help. So I think with just two versions, it's not something I'd really worry about. I mean, it's it's nice to clean up, but it's not something where when you look at a website and you see dub, 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 non dub, 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 it's not like a red flag that's going to cause any problems for the website. It's 
trickier if you have things like session parameters where you have URLs that change all the time, where when you look at the page once, it has this URL. You look at it again, it has a different URL, where we end up essentially having an infinite number of URLs leading to the same content, then that's really problematic for us. Uh, the other thing that's often kind of touched upon there as well is if you have things like uh, descriptions on your site that are duplicated across multiple sites. So maybe you're selling books and you have the book description on there. And of course, you can't or you don't want to rewrite all of the book descriptions for every book that's out there. So you take them from a database or a feed or something like that. And from our point of view, that's not necessarily problematic. Uh, what will generally happen there is if someone is searching for that content, like something within that general generic description that you're also reusing, we'll recognize that multiple pages use the same description and try to pick one of them to show to the user. So we'll see perhaps maybe you have that book, maybe someone in China or in France on a bookstore has that book as well on their website. And depending on where the user is, maybe we'll show your version or maybe the French version. It kind of depends on that. And we look at more the, the content around that generic description as well. So if there are things like reviews that are unique to your website, if you have um, information that's specific to your website on there as well, such as maybe your address or uh, just general information about geotargeting, those kind of things, all of that helps us to pick one of these versions and to show that in search. And it's not that we would demote or kind of uh, see those other versions as being bad. It's just that we think these pages are kind of the same content. The user is looking for the same thing. So we'll pick one of them and show that in search. OK. And uh, more questions? Anyone? All right. Hello. Frank? Hi. Uh, question is, can Google Spider, like polls, surveys, quizzes, and I read someplace that event, I don't know if they're doing it yet, where they can actually spider a picture uh, relating to the content of the picture, not the text only. Yeah, so. Um, I think he's talking about DeepMind. DeepMind, yeah, that's, I guess that's a bit different. But with regards to like forms and surveys, those kind of things. In general, we tend not to fill out forms and submit them. Um, so in the past, what we've sometimes done is if we recognize that something is a search form and we realize that we're missing content from this website, then we'll try keywords from that site and see if we find links to specific pages. So it's kind of like Googlebot going to the search form and saying, oh, I know this website is about cats, so I'll ask it about a specific type of cat and look at the links that the search form gives back and crawl those links to see if I'm missing anything specific. So if we can crawl a website normally, we don't really need to do that. But in some cases, for example, maybe government websites that are set up in, in a really bad way that the content isn't linked, but there's lots of content out there. If you just knew which keywords to search for, in cases like that, we might fill out the form and try to find something. But it's not the case that we would like run across a survey form and start filling that out, or Googlebot goes to an e-commerce site and starts ordering stuff. That's, that's something that shouldn't really happen. Uh, with regards to images, we, we do have some really smart technology about recognizing the content on the images. Um, that's something that you can kind of play with in a really easy way by, by using Google Photos, for example. So if you uh, upload images to Google Photos or if you have your phone set up to upload images there, you can search for keywords. And it'll try to recognize what this keyword is about and try to find pictures that match that based on what you have in your photo library. And it's not the case that you need to manually tag those photos, but rather we recognize, oh, this is a picture of a house. So if you're searching for house, then we'll try to show that to you. And that's kind of what we're trying to do with search as well. Does XF data, can Google read that? Uh, we do read that. I mean, that's a part of the image file. So we, we kind of have to read that. But I don't think we use that at all for our ranking. So it, no sense in like hiding keywords in there. I, I think we mostly use it to recognize maybe the date or the resolution of an image, those kind of things. 
when we review Google Search Console data with our clients, they invariably say, oh, there's no way that's true because my own personal experience is I've seen it on page X or page Y. And we kind of walk through what are the variables in that. I'd love to hear your context on what are the parameters in the Search Console data in terms of either sampling or in terms of how it's influenced by personal search results that might account for what you see in Search Console being different from your own personal experience? Yeah, that's, that's always tricky. So um, in, in general, what Search Console does is it takes all of the queries that we get that lead to your site being shown in Search. It removes things that we think might be personal queries. So if someone is searching for their name and they're the only person searching for that, then we probably try to remove that. And it tries to filter the, some things out like, maybe some punctuation, those kind of things. But apart from that, we essentially take all of that data and use that uh, for search analytics. There is no um, sampling going on there. We, we essentially take all of that. Uh, what, what we usually find when, when there are differences between like, what I see in search and what Search Console tells me is that there is a specific kind of uh, aspect of your site that's being shown in some places, which kind of skews the general numbers. So it used to be, for example, that we would show images and web search together in Search Console by default, so that if your site ranks really well in image search but doesn't show up at all in web search, it'll have an average ranking that's fairly high, where if you say, I go to web search, I never see my site. But uh, if you went to image search, then maybe you would see it. Uh, sometimes we'll also have this skew across countries uh, for example, the, the Google Webmaster Central blog, for some reason, ranked on the first page in Google Canada for the query Google. And you can imagine the query Google gets like millions of people who are searching for that. So if we looked at uh, the search analytics data, we'd see like this really high number for impressions for the query Google for our blog. But actually, when we search for it, we never see it in the search results when we search for Google. So just because it was visible in Canada or it, or it is visible in Canada doesn't, doesn't mean I'll see it myself. So what we did in a case like that is really try to drill down what specific aspect was relevant there. Is this like, is for people on a smartphone or desktop in specific countries? Um, where is this number coming from that's kind of skewing the average number that they're seeing there? So that's kind of what I'd look at there. That was a good question. Um, I have a question, and I've been, uh, what is Google's look or, or view on, we know that SEOs and stuff, they go out and you know, they get links for their clients and stuff like that, uh, you know, legitimately. Like, they're looking for relevant sources and that type of stuff. But what is Google's look on? I mean, what is your stand on that? On SEOs or on links? Well, no, uh, SEOs going out and, you know, trying to get quality links from other sites, you know, whether it be outreach or, or if it's, uh, you know, just getting a link on their own and then, aside from the natural link requiring? So I guess taking a step back in general, I think SEOs are doing things that are really important in that they're making a lot of this content accessible and useful through search engines to a larger audience. So in general, I'd say SEO is an important role that really helps to kind of help with the businesses that are doing something online. Uh, with regards to links, I find that a bit more problematic or a bit trickier in that there's a really thin line with going out and kind of promoting your site and going out and just trying to do something to get that link. So that's something where I'd, I'd almost be tempted to say if you're going out and specifically asking for a link, then that's something where you're almost heading into that territory of unnatural links. And if this is the only way that your site is getting links, then that's probably something you should avoid doing. On the other hand, if you see something really awesome and you think, oh, my site would fit perfectly in there, and maybe the, this reporter or this person who set up that other page just wasn't aware of my site, kind of like promoting your business, that's something that I could think makes sense. But 
it's really something where you want to be careful of that line of like just going out and trying to work so that you get one link from this website because of whatever you're doing with regards to outreach. So that's kind of something where I'd, I'd be really worried about in a sense or try to be really careful in the sense that you're not doing something just for the sake of a link, but rather maybe you're doing it to really promote your business. And if it ends up being a nofollow link or if they just mention a link without a, the URL without a link, then that's just as good for your business because people come and look at your site and they want to see what's, what's happening there. So that's kind of where I'd stand there. Okay. And obviously, you know, you know, a lot of everybody here is white hat and want to do the right things, but we uh, sometimes, you know, and you know, that's what I'm talking about. If somebody goes out to get a link that's to promote their business, not a paid link or not spammy, but you know, going out to. Yeah, I, I just think like like overall, you should aim to make sure that your website attracts links naturally, in the sense that uh, if all of the links to your website are just those that are from your like manual outreach, those kind of things, then that's something where you might want to look at your website and think about what am I doing wrong that people who go to my website aren't recommending it to, to other people. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of something that I almost see as a sign for the webmaster themselves, kind of like what should I be doing differently on my website so that it more naturally attracts links rather than requires me to kind of go out and do these things manually. Gotcha. Um, so is there anything you can let us know that's coming out recently to, or coming out soon to maybe an algorithm or something you guys are working on that might be good information? Not that uh, I, I can think about at the moment. So. You asked me this yesterday. I went through some of the things that, that we're looking at launching in the near future, but um, I don't think I have anything that I can share. Sorry. OK. <laughs> we got a question here. Hold on. I've been telling clients uh, they need to have uh, mobile versions of their sites, but uh, I've just gone by what I've read about mobile getting and stuff. But what are the real? facts about you know our sites penalized for not having a mobile version and if they are you know how, how much is it is it 10 percent or is it you know part partially or how much of it is not being used or or being used now uh, we, we don't have any fixed percent on things like that um, essentially what happens there in practice is if someone is searching on a smartphone and we recognize that a site is mobile friendly then we'll promote it a little bit in search um, so it's not the case that this site would have any different treatment on desktop search for example so um, that's something to, to kind of keep in mind it's also the case that we try to recognize when sites are really relevant and still kind of show those sites so if you're a small business and someone is searching for your name, your website isn't going to disappear from the search results. We'll still show that, even if it's not mobile friendly. I think the, the bigger impact that you would see by having a mobile friendly site is really within the website and with the way that people engage with the content that you have, the services you provide on mobile devices. So we're seeing more and more, it, it kind of depends on the country. We're seeing people who primarily access the internet on a smartphone. So that's something where if your website doesn't work at all on mobile, or is really a big hassle on mobile, uh, then that's something that will definitely affect that business in the long run. So I think in the long run, that's definitely something that's really important with regards to ranking, especially if you're looking at smaller businesses where people are really specifically looking for that business. I suspect it's not that critical. Okay, um, I have a question. The uh, I, I was reading online that you were inquiring to other people how they find duplicate content. Was that a feature that possibly you might add in the future for uh, the Search Console? <laughs> letting people know if they do have con duplicate content? Um, I 
Initially, it was more of a survey to kind of understand what people were doing. Uh, we're, we're looking at setting up a, a, a short video about duplicate content to kind of better explain what, what the problems are there. And uh, some of the things that we mentioned there with re or we were thinking about mentioning with regards to how to recognize duplicate content, uh, we just wanted to kind of get a gut, gut check and make sure that we're covering the things that uh, webmasters in general would be looking at as well. And one of the things there that we noticed is that one of the ways we were going to recommend on the video was actually something that nobody else was doing. So that's something that we said, OK, well, if nobody is doing this and uh, we have better ways of doing this, maybe we don't even need to mention it in the video. So that kind of helped us in, in that regards. Uh, but it was interesting getting so much feedback there. I didn't uh, expect that much there. So it's something that I think is a sign for us that maybe we should be doing more with regards to duplicate content. Maybe there are things that we can tell webmasters more in Search Console about duplicate content, or at least within our help center, within the blogs, on our videos, those kind of things. So it was. I, I found it really insightful to get that much feedback there. But at the moment, we don't have any feature planned uh, that will be groundbreaking in that regard yet. Yeah, my only concern with that is if we had that, then you'd have a lot of people filling out DM uh, CA, uh, <laughs> complaints, you know? Yeah, I think that's, that's one aspect uh, that kind of goes there. So that's like the external duplicate content. If someone copies your content, uh, that kind of thing. I think it's it, it kind of happens that people copy content. It's not not something that is particularly new, that, that people scrape other websites and they put it online. I think from our point of view, the ideal situation is our algorithms just recognize that appropriately and just don't rank that content. And if it's not visible in the search results, I mean, there's no need for the webmaster to go off and do any kind of uh, submissions or legal complaints, those kind of things. It kind of saves their time. It helps them to concentrate on things that are really relevant for their site rather than sending them off on these legal wild goose chases to kind of uh, find someone in some other country that's scraping their content. So if we show the right content in the search results, we don't show the scrapers, then I think that's the better solution than giving webmasters all of this information about these sites are scraping your content. Maybe you should take action on them. But if, if they're not really visible in search, I don't know if you really need to do anything. Gotcha. It's, it's, it's up to Google to determine which was the original content. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we do a pretty good job of this in the meantime. Um, we used to get lots of complaints about uh, us showing scrapers above the original sites in search, but I've seen fewer and fewer complaints about that over time. So I think, in general, our algorithms there have gotten a lot better. Great. Any other questions? Uh, Pam. No, I was quiet for too long. Um, John, you've talked a couple times about uh, looking at how much other people recommend your website. What kind of signals should I be looking at to, to determine that? Um, we essentially use links as a proxy for that. So if we see that people are linking to your website, then that's a sign for us that they, they're kind of recommending that. Do you think that that possibly may go away in the future, is link being uh, the popularity? Um, I suspect not anytime soon. Uh, I suspect our algorithms will get better at trying to understand natural links and unnatural links a little bit better, but it's still a really useful signal for us. So, uh, for example, also in, in Russia, Yandex for a while publicly said, OK, we're not using links um, within, I think, for local searches within some, some regions of Russia. But uh, they also came back to links at some point and said, OK, well, some of these are actually quite useful for that. Gotcha. And uh, any more questions? OK. One more from me, I think. Um, what are, is Google using any at all, any if all, any, <laughs> messed that up, <laughs> social signals? Are you looking at Twitter? Or are you looking at Google Plus? And as far as 
you know, relevancy? Or are you doing any of that at all? Uh, we're not using it for crawling, indexing, and ranking. So it's not that if people are talking about your site on Twitter that you'd have an advantage there. But we do show these social posts in the search results. So if people are talking about your website on Twitter and you're searching on a phone, then we might show those tweets in the search results. Or if they're posting publicly on Facebook about your website, then that's a piece of content that should, could show up in the search results as well. So it's not that there's any kind of a direct effect in that we see, oh, 500 tweets, that's like one link, um, but rather more the indirect effect. And of course, that this content is actually available for ranking too. OK. And, and as for, back on your, uh, sorry, I had one more question. I know I said one more while, while ago. But on the, when you were talking about mobile apps in your presentation, is that something that you're going to put in the search along with that website as far as you know, tying those two together? Yeah, so there are different ways that we show mobile apps in search. There was recently a great post on Search Engine Land about that, which had like the screenshot, a long row of the different variations that the apps are shown. So on the one hand, we have the install buttons that we sometimes show in search, if it's installed or not. And sometimes we'll show like a deep link to the app directly in search with a link below that, maybe like uh, go to the website instead. So in general, the install buttons are something that additionally show up in search. And if we recognize that a page is equivalent on the app, we'll just show the app link instead of the uh, web page link. OK. Any questions? Anybody on disavow or anything like that? <laughs> OK, John, I really appreciate your time and, and, and spending time with us and answering questions. And uh, it's an honor. I appreciate it. No problem. Oh, yeah. Nice to jump in here. <laughs> you know, I, I hear you catch a lot of hell from the SEO community, and I, I think you're doing a great job, you know, stepping up to the plate since Matt left and, you know, keeping us all informed, and I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I mean, it's, it's fun talking with SEOs. I wish I were in Florida now. It would probably be a bit warmer than here. So uh, I wish you all a great day. What is the temperature there? Um, it's been rainy and pretty cold today, so I don't know what the temperature actually is. I don't know what it would be in Fahrenheit either. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's colder than than summer should be. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again, and and uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Great. No problem. Bye. Bye. Bye.